Welcome. Today I will be covering the cell theory and the sciences that contributed to the cell theory. So the scientists that you are staring at are the scientists that contributed to the cell theory. From left to right, you have Hook, Leeuwenhoek, Schleiden, Schwann, and Burkow. Now, I want you to remember their last names. If you remember their first names, great, uh, but very important that you remember their last name. So just some random facts about cells. Um, it says that the average human being is composed of around 100 trillion individual cells. So if you think about the size of a human being and just knowing that they have about 100 trillion individual cells, this should let you know that cells are really, really, really small. If it's going to take around 100 trillion for the average human being. Also, another fun fact, it says that it would take as many as 50 cells to cover the area of a dot on the letter I. Now, if you look at that little dot right there at the top, and it's going to take about 50 cells to cover that dot, that should let you know as well that cells are going to be really small. So up first we have Robert Hooke, and I like to think of him as the scientist that actually got us hooked on cells. Um, why? Because he was the first person to discover cells. Um, and the type of cell he looked at was a cork cell. Now, you may have heard of cork before, um, that it's used to stopper a wine bottle. Um, well, that's the same type of cork, and cork is actually the dead part of a tree. So, um, he did use cork, um, and cork was, is not a living thing, like I just said. Um, it is something that is dead. So, he was the first to observe cells, but the cells that he looked at, they were actually dead cells. Um, and all he did was he took some cork, sliced it with the razor, put it under the microscope, and this is what he saw. Um, and what he saw, you will see on the right-hand side. Um, and this is actually a picture, um, but during that time, they did not have cameras to take pictures. So, he actually had to draw out what he saw. Um, so, he looked at the cork under the microscope, and he came up with all of these drawings. Um, created a book and it ended up being a bestseller because at that time individuals or people they had not seen sales this is something that was newly discovered um, so that's why it went on to become a bestseller now why did he name what he saw sales how did he coin the term sale if you actually look at the drawing you will see these tiny little boxes there you'll see a lot of individual boxes there so what he said is that um, I see these little boxes and it kind of reminds me of the tiny rectangular rooms that monks used to live in and these tiny rectangular rooms it may put you in the mindset of a jail cell no it did not get the name from the term jail cell it got the term cell you love um, and again these were the little rooms that the monks used to live in so um, this is how he came up with the name cells. So again, just a little recap, Robert Hooke, he was the first person to discover cells. Um, and again, since he discovered them, I like to say that he got us hooked on cells. Um, the cells that he viewed, they were cork cells and cork cells were um, or are dead parts of a um, tree. Next person, Anton Van Leeuwenhoek. Um, now, Leeuwenhoek, the way that I remember him um, is that his last name starts with the L, um, and also I put it with the word living, which also starts with an L. So, he was the first person to actually view living cells under a microscope. Um, and he did a couple of things. Um, if you look at the first bullet, it says in 1673, he used a handmade microscope to observe pond scum and discovered single cell organisms and he called them animals. Well, we give these single cell organisms a name today. Um, so I'm going to show you a little video of what these single cell organisms look like. So what Leeuwenhoek did was he went and got a um, sample of pond water, put the pond water under the microscope, and he was actually able to see things moving in that pond water. We actually cannot classify them as animals, 
Um, but they resemble animals, so this is why he gave them the term animal pulse. So here is one of those things, and this thing is called amoeba. Um, and amoeba, it's filled with a lot of cytoplasm. Um, as you can see, it has like a, a jelly-like um, look to it. Um, but actually, what you're noticing with the amoeba, it's actually moving. And these are its feet, and it's actually false feet. It's called pseudopods. But this is one of the things that he saw in the pond water. So this is one of the other organisms that Leeuwenhoek was able to see in the pond water. Um, and if you look at it, what you'll notice is that it is mainly green or it has these little green spots in it, and the green spots are going to be chloroplasts. So this organism is actually able to photosynthesize, um, feed itself using sunlight, or um, sunlight and other things, of course, or it can actually be fed. Now, if you look here, you'll notice it has this little tail on it. This tail actually helps it to move, and this tail is called flagella. So I'm going to play the video just so you can see how it moves. And again, this is something that you would not be able to see with your naked eye. Um, its whole entire body, so to speak, is made up of one cell. Um, so you would need a microscope to see it. But you can see it's moving its flagella to move. Leeuwenhoek is also known as the first person to discover bacteria. Um, and bacteria is also a living thing. So keep in mind, Leeuwenhoek starts with an L, living starts with an L. Um, so he was the first person to discover bacteria. And what was said is that um, he actually went to his family, scraped their teeth, and viewed what he scraped from their teeth under the microscope. And what he was able to see was bacteria. So he's also credited as the first person um, to view bacteria. Um, so Leeuwenhoek, just to recap, name starts with an L. Um, think about living. He was the first person to view living cells. Um, and the cells that he viewed, number one, he got some pond water, put it under the microscope, and he saw things like amoeba and euglena. Um, and number two, he was the first person to actually view So the next two scientists are Schleiden and Schwann. Um, and again, if you remember their last names, that would be fine with me. So Schleiden and Schwann, their names both start with an S. And it may be hard to kind of remember what they did because their names both start with the same letter. Um, but one worked with plants and the other one worked with animals. And the way that I like to think about this I think about Schwann, and his name sounds like a swan, which is an animal. So Schwann is actually the scientist that worked with animals, and Schleiden was the one that worked with plants. He was a botanist. So what they did specifically, Theodore Schwann, um, what he did was he took samples of animal tissues from different animals, and he placed those under the microscope. And every time he put it under the microscope, he noticed that the animals were made of cells, or their tissues were actually composed of cells. Schleiden did the same thing, but he did it for plants. Every time he took these samples and put it under the microscope for different plants, he noticed that plants were all made of cells. Verkal is the next scientist, um, and he came up with the saying that all cells must come from pre-existing cells. So if you look at the process that is listed here, um, what you'll notice is this. This is mitosis, and mitosis is the process where one cell will create another cell. Um, and what they like to say to help you remember vercal, um, they say cows have to come from cows, so cells come from cells. I know it sounds crazy, um, but hopefully that will help you to remember that. So Verkow said that all cells have to come from a pre-existing cell. And it kind of makes you think about what came first, the chicken or the, the egg. All right, so that brings us to the cell theory. Um, and what you want to remember is a theory is something that's very different from a law. 
Um, and a theory is something that has been proven over and over again, and it yields the same results. Even though it could be wrong or it may be proven to be incorrect, um, but every time we look at it, it yields the same results. So these are the three parts of the cell theory. Number one, um, it says all organisms are composed of one or more cells. So basically what that means, um, it means if you are a living thing, you have to have at least one cell. Or you'll have more cells. So in the beginning, we said that humans, they're composed of, of around 100 trillion cells. But if you take something like euglena, it's only one cell. So um, those things are both living. And if you are living, you have to have a cell. So that's the first part of the cell theory. All living things are made of cells. I'm going to jump to the third part real fast, and that is just Verkau's contribution. Um, and what he said again was that all cells come from pre-existing cells. And they're going to be produced by cell division, um, either mitosis, meiosis, binary fission, things like that. The second part, it says that the cell is the basic unit of life in all living things. So what that means is that um, I'll give you a list to kind of help you see what this means. So here's that list that I told you about, and we're going to start uh, with an atom. And atoms, um, just to kind of refresh your memory, you think about the periodic table, you have all these elements on, um, on the periodic table, um, and the atom is going to be the smallest piece of that element that cannot be broken down into further pieces. So the way that this kind of works is that um, if I start with an atom and I put more than one atom together, it creates something called a molecule. Okay? Um, and if I have more than one molecule and put that together, it creates something called a macromolecule. Well, if I have more than one macromolecule and I put that together, it's going to create things called organelles. More than one organelle will create a cell. Um, more than one cell will create a tissue. More than one tissue will create an organ. More than one organ, organ will create an organ system. And if you have all the organ systems working together, more than one, uh, it will create an organism. Now, we have gone past this point with our last, um, or our unit before last called ecology. You know that more than one organism in the same place at, in the same time, at the same time of the same type, uh, it's called a population. More than one different type of population we know would be a community. Then to go further, you would have your ecosystem. Um, after the ecosystem, it would be biome. And then last, it would be your biosphere. Okay, so we know all of those. So we now have a new list that we have to learn. So again, you have more than one atom, it will create a molecule, more than one molecule will make a macromolecule, more than one macromolecule will create organelles, organelles are the parts that will create cells, more than one cell will create a tissue, more than one tissue will create an organ, and so forth. So um, basically, that second part of the cell theory, it says cells are the basic unit of life. So this is how it kind of works. If I look at an atom, and these are things on the periodic table like hydrogen, nitrogen, potassium, um, oxygen. These things are going to be abiotic things, and we know abiotic means non-living. Okay, so if I put more than one atom together and create a molecule, that molecule is still going to be something that is non-living. Macromolecule made from the molecules is going to be something again that's going to be non living or abiotic. Okay, organelles are also going to be 
abiotic or not living. But when we get to cell, I'm going to put this in green because it gives that a green light. Um, when we get to cells, cells are going to be our first living thing. So this is the most, this is the first thing that we get to that is living. So this is the most basic thing that we can get to that is living. So again, everything before that, um, atom, molecule, macromolecule, organelle, these things are all non-living things. But when we get to cell, this is the first living thing. Um, so this is where that part of the cell theory came from that said the cell is the basic unit of life. Now, um, I have a little saying to kind of help you remember, um, and not everything in order, um, but just sell. Um, and this is the way I remembered it. I said, you had a person that was in a jail cell, and we know that most of the time in jail cells, they have these little um, toilets or whatever. So I say the guy he was, or the guy or the girl was in the jail cell, um, needed some tissue to wipe their organ because their organ system, something like the digestive system, did not work properly. So cell tissue, organ, organ system. So that's just my little sand to actually help you remember those in order. So those are the three parts of the cell theory. Um, again, the first part, all living things are made up of cells. And Schleiden and Schwein contributed to that because you have to think, um, what I said, they took those samples, put it under the microscope, and they noticed that all living things had cells. Or they noticed that plants and animals had cells, so they concluded that all living things had cells. Um, cells are the basic unit of life, which we just went over with that chart. And Verkal, he said all cells come from pre-existing cells. So this is the end of our lesson, so we're going to kind of do a review. Question one, the blank is the basic unit of life. So what do you think is the basic unit of life? I'll give you a second to think. All right, so if you said cell, that is correct. The cell is the basic unit of life. Question two, and look at the picture. He stated that all plants are composed of cells. All right, his name was Schleiden. If you remember Schleiden, all plants are made of cells. All right, question three. This scientist is given credit for discovering cells. Look at your picture again. All right, so the person that discovered cells was Robert Hook. Remember, he got us hooked on cells. Um, and if you look there, you see a little hook, and in, um, through that hook, you see a port, a piece of port. So if you remember, um, the type of cells that he looked at um, were cork cells, and cork cells are dead. So he was the first person to see dead cells under the microscope. All right, who can already guess this name? All right, he stated that all animals are composed of cells, and this scientist's name was Schwann. And again, Schwann sounds like that animal that is a swan. All right, this scientist stated that cells come from pre-existing cells. So I told you his is going to be a little bit hard to remember, um, but I did say cows come from cows. So cells come from cells, and the cow, remember, vercal. Um, so vercal actually said that all cells come from a pre-existing cell. All right, this scientist first saw life in pond water. He called them animals. So life and living both start with an L, and that scientist is Leeuwenhoek, who also starts with um, an L. So he was the first person to view living things uh, in pond water and remember he was also the first person to um, see bacteria. Alright, take a second, 
See if you can remember um, the three parts of the cell theory. All right, so first part, all organisms are made up of one or more cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells, and cells are the basic unit of life. Finally, just some parting thoughts. It says, it is amazing to think that the cells that make up our bodies are just as alive as we are, because remember, they're the basic unit of life. Humans are just an intricately designed community of cells which must work together to survive. All right, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I will.